The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Welcome to Gate City Chronicles. I'm Kevin Avard, your host. And today, we're going to be talking about education and charter schools. And today, I have with me Amy Bottomley, mm -hmm. uh, the director of a, uh, the Micro Society, Mi Micro Society, Micro Society Academy, Academy Charter, charter School. Schools. Yeah, I, I Max for short. <laughs> <laughs> and I did it without my glasses. And I, <laughs> it's a mouthful. Yeah, and I have Susanna. Uh, Williams, uh, and you are a curriculum coordinator. That's right. Well, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. So there's been a lot of talk in the legislature recently about charter schools and the funding of charter schools. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I could get into your background at first, but uh, tell me, w what is a charter school? So charter schools are free choice for parents. They're mm -hmm. actually public schools. We still are mandated by the state to take state testing. But we have a little more freedom in how we go about that. Um, we, are, we like to have more creativity with our teachers and how they meet the state standards. And specifically to Max, a lot of them have themes, if you will. There's other schools out there that are arts-based. And here at Micro Society Academy, we are about real-world learning. And so we're taking the standards and we're connecting what your students are learning in the classroom and how it applies to real life. And so that's what's really neat about our school is the kids will know the whys behind mm -hmm. what they're doing in the classroom day to day. Now, on the political scene, they're talking a lot about the Common Core. Now, you're the, you're the curriculum coordinator, and it, you know we wanted to make that an option for people rather than it being a top-down type of thing so that uh, people could have the flexibility. Mm -hmm. But uh, and our, our, curriculum, to... our curriculum will still be aligned with the Common Core standards. Mm -hmm. um, but the nice thing about being a charter school is that we have the freedom uh, to decide how we're going to do that. Right. Um, so the students will still be learning the things that they need to learn in first, second, third grade. Um, but our teachers will have the creativity um, to do that in the way that they think best fits their students' needs. Now, it might be a silly question, but why do the teachers need this creativity? Don't they have this in regular public schools? So right now, regular public schools, a lot of the times, um, <coughs> administration are telling teachers, you're going to teach this on this day. We all have to pre and post test at the same time. And we're not going to be doing that with our teachers. We're going to say, here's the set of standards you have to meet. We're going to still do progress monitoring throughout the year to ensure our students are making growth. Mm -hmm. But we are going to do less mandated testing than a lot of districts are doing. Um, and we want them to say, you know what, here's it. We might give them curriculum to support use as a tool in the classroom, but we're not mandating they use this textbook mm -hmm. and teach it this way. So if they want to go and create their own lesson, and hopefully you know, our, we want everything to be hands-on and project-based, that they're going to create that and you know, incite, you know, get the students ex excited about what they're learning. And we're not going to say, use this textbook, teach this chapter on this day. Right, because not everybody learns the exact same way. Correct. Exactly. Now, you're from Texas. You've taught in Texas. Yes. And yes. Uh, you've taught in Boston. Yes. Welcome to the Granite State. Thank you. How long have you been here? Since October. Since October? Less than a year. Oh, yes. so you didn't experience our, our beautiful winters yet? Um, well, I experienced a few in Boston. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, you had record breaking uh, well, snow. But I, I, yes, I survived this past winter, so <laughs> I know I can make it. Oh, okay, wonderful. <laughs> uh, what is your background in teaching? Um, I've mostly taught in the primary grades. Um, I've taught first grade, second grade, and third grade, as well as elementary art, kindergarten through sixth grade. Mm -hmm. And how about you? Um, my majority, my whole career has been in the Hall's Brookline Cooperative School District in the Hall School District. I was a special educator there. At the high school, I was a special education department chair, and then I moved into 
assistant principal and special ed coordinator at Hollis Upper Elementary School for the last five years. And I take it you both love to teach? Absolutely. Love kids. So, you know, I haven't gone to school to learn how to be a teacher, but when you went to, to in your education to become a teacher, what was your thoughts? Did, did you go thinking that you were going to be able to create your own curriculum or be able to work individually and, and inspire students? Or uh, was it a surprise to you when you saw how it actually works? Is that a good question? <laughs> it, it is, actually. Um, I think, yes, when I was in school um, studying how to become a teacher, um, I, I did think I would have a little bit more freedom than I ended up having. Um, in the large urban public school districts where I taught mm -hmm. in Texas. Um, and I, I had some wonderful administrators and wonderful coworkers that are passionate about education. But I think we often shared a common frustration um, in the fact that, that we were confined to the specific curriculum. Um, and such large schools often, if there were six or seven third grades, we all needed to be teaching this lesson this day, and we all had to send this homework assignment, and it didn't always meet the needs of our students. Right. Um, and so when I taught at a charter school in Boston, that was one of the nice things I liked about that, is having the freedom. Um, the, it, it was a large charter school, but the administration especially had the freedom to choose the curriculum that we felt best met the needs of our students, and we didn't have to do what the other 100,000 kids in the school district were doing. Right. Um, so I felt like it, it better served our students. So when you have this freedom, then, then you have another complication. Now you're in special ed to some degree, yep. and knowing that each child learns differently. And so you have basically a, a, a guideline, mm -hmm. but then you have this individuality that you have to throw into the mix, and you've got to somehow bring along these kids to meet up to these guidelines. That's a challenge in itself, isn't it? Yeah, but teachers are working to differentiate for the students um, to meet their needs, and, and kids learn different paces, mm -hmm. and they are on different levels, and we're hoping to have competency-based learning where kids can progress at their own speed. You know, we're designing our schedule so that if a student needs to be challenged and go, you know, accelerate up or down, they can, because we want to ensure that they're not bored and then they're, you know, getting their needs met, met and being excited about being at school. Now, when I was a kid, if you learned differently, you were basically labeled, mm -hmm. uh, and you were the problem child. So now, if you're an adult in this particular uh, period of time, and you see that your child's not excelling, are they a problem child? Or are they just learning differently? How does a parent know when to say, you know, the traditional public schools not meeting the needs of my child but I don't know if it's a discipline problem or if it's uh, a boredom problem or, or the light bulb just didn't go off yet. I think, I think it, a lot of those are yeah, related. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Kids don't act out without, there's always a reason. There's always something behind it. And one thing that is neat about micro society is that there's over 200 established micro society charter schools um, across the United States and in other countries that are thriving. And when you talk to the other educators and administrators in these existing programs, they say that they're meeting the needs of struggling kids better than traditional public schools because of the micro society period and that hands on time. We're literally a microcosm of our own world. They develop their own little town in our school. They're citizens, not students. Nice little segue because I was going to say, yeah. you know, what is micro yes, society? That's micro -society. We were definitely yeah. going to head there. So. And um, so, we're, so they have a period every day where kids get to do their own ventures and agencies. So students are going to spend the first four or six weeks writing business plans and, and proposing different agencies and ventures. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be owners and operators, and they're going to be managers, and they're going to go through job fairs and application processes and have jobs and apply what they've learned in the classroom in our own little town. You know, it's funny how some kids can graduate from high school, not have any work skills, not know how to balance a checkbook, have no clue as to... How to write a resume. Yeah. How to write a resume, how Not to communicate <laughs> in an interview, yep. those how sort of things. How to communicate, and, but, but they might be honor students, mm -hmm. uh, and they've just, they, they've not learned how to apply uh, in, in everyday life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it seems like we've lost, you know, in our earlier traditions, it seems that's how people learned. They, they applied what they learned mm -hmm. in the process of learning uh, somehow. And I think in, in addition to um, the 
business and economic side of that, uh, another thing that we do in the micro society is develop our own social contract and what kind of government, what kind of society do we want to have creating mm -hmm. our own constitution, our own laws, mm -hmm. enforcing those laws. And so the kids really make it their own. I mean, they're making those decisions. As, as teachers and administrators, we facilitate that and, and give guidance, suggestions, um, but, but the students are really making it their own. And so I think that also cuts down on a lot of discipline issues mm -hmm. that you might see in a traditional school mm -hmm. because the students made those, those rules, those laws themselves, right. and will enforce them. And, and so, we hope have more ownership. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's our, our mantra is voice and choice. We want voice and choice for the students. We want voice and choice for the staff because if they have a say in how we're running things and how we're learning, what we're learning and when we're learning, the game. they have skin in the game. You know, I, I, I keep drawing back. I've talked to many people in charter schools in, in the past, and I always go back to my sixth grade teacher, <laughs> Mr. Muse. And it was in Temple Street School here in Nashua, New Hampshire. And that, it, now it's a, it's a retirement home. But Mr. Muse basically had us learn how to take cuttings from plants and develop those cuttings from plants. And as we, our grades improved, then we had the money to buy more plants with big money. Mm -hmm. And then we would build more and more, and more plants. And at the end of the year, it, he would buy those plants back from us for cash mm -hmm. because he had a farm. Oh. And it was his way of applying science and the market at the same time learning how to, you know, take You just care. nailed a perfect example of what our micro society period is and it, what it can be. It was very, mm -hmm. very simple yep. and, and uh, not as complex because it was just one sixth grade mm -hmm. class. But I thought, wow, what foresight. Mm -hmm. And it began to start my, my mind. I, I was very horrible in, in, in my elementary school. I really, really struggled with it. And it wasn't until Mr. Muse's classes and then maybe seventh or eighth grade when I went to a museum and I could see history. Mm -hmm. Boom, the light bulb just went. And it was actually at the, uh, the museum in, uh, of Armory in, in Worcester, Mass. Mm -hmm. Something clicked. And somewhere, somehow, some kids just don't get it. And they don't see how this applies to life. And mm -hmm. then they can't, if you can't bring it in, then they're bored with it and they can't mm -hmm. grow. Absolutely. And, and I, growing up, I. I was pretty strong academically with math and reading and writing skills, but at least around the third, fourth, fifth grade years, social studies was my worst subject mm -hmm. because I just didn't, I didn't get it. You know, I didn't understand how it applied to me. And I think if I had been in a micro society school where I was part of a constitutional convention yeah. or, you know, a legislature or the judicial process, um, you know, like you said, going to the museum helped that click for you. And I think, having the kids make that their own, they will actually experience it, and that will increase their understanding of it yeah. exponentially. It, it, it's wonderful when you can apply things and kids can get it, and, and, and you see that little light bulb go off. And when the kids come to the Capitol and into the Senate room, I mm -hmm. teach them a little lesson, and I pick on three or four different kids, and I said, does everybody know this person? They all raise their hand. I said, now this person calls me up and says, I got an idea. I think everybody should have blue hair because we don't want anybody to feel left out. So <laughs> the reason's good. Everybody knows this person? This other person says, I need to have red hair. I think everybody should have red hair. That way nobody feels any different. Well, these two are going at it. And then, of course, another person says, I got a bill that says we should all just have purple hair so nobody's fighting. <laughs> and then there's another person way over in the corner, and I'll pick them out, and I'll say, now this person has an idea, too, that Everybody should be able to keep their own hair the way it should be, just as natural. Here's the problem. This person who says we need to have blue hair, I've got a lot of friends. And they call me. And they said, Mr. Avard, we need to have a bill, and everybody has to have a blue, ha uh, blue hair. Nobody else called me. So guess what? We're all going to have to have blue hair. Very simple. But you see the eyes go up like, well, wait a minute. I don't want to have blue hair. Well, you didn't call me. And if, and if you do not get involved, if somebody's going to make a rule that's going to affect your life somewhere, because we have a 1,000 bills that come to the Senate every session or the House in, in the Senate, that type of stuff brings it home. 
I'm not sure if that gets in the, in the public school, mm -hmm. but you, you see the light, go, light bulbs go off and, and you think, oh, wow, you know, you've got to bring it home to them on some, on some different level. So the micro society does that both on. Well, and, and what you're saying too, is we want that collaboration amongst our students and creativity and all these are 21st century skills that you need, the critical thinking. Right. You know, we are preparing students for jobs that aren't even in existence yet. And so they really need to have those pieces in place in order to apply them later in life. And mm -hmm. so to have that opportunity to have your little town and have your legislation and be able to collaborate and come up with these ideas mm -hmm. and how do we work together? How do you work together? It's not just about opening a te textbook, reading it and being able to take a test. It's how can we make decisions together? How Absolutely. Do and I think that's something that we don't really think about a lot in education. It's just, oh, this, this child needs to learn the skill you know, it's just about me and that child, and me and that child, and me and that child. And we, we, we so often skip that step of letting them collaborate because you right. have to learn how to work with other people, brainstorm together, think creatively, um, come up with solutions together. And that's something that our students will be doing on a daily basis because um, our, our micro society period is not held in each individual classroom <coughs> among those students. It's all together. Kindergarten through fifth grade will all be together every day for that hour. And so you, you don't have the age separation. They, they can learn from each other. And it's Real wonderful. life situation, basically. Right, because we don't have age separation in our work. So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and um, they need to need, no. So here's a great idea, and it, it seems like it's working. And like you said, there's the model uh, schools across the country. Are you a threat to the traditional system? Is there a tension, or are, they work, or, or are, they being, are you being perceived as a way to augment? I mean, are you accepted in, in, in the education society here? Well, I think we need to make our mark and prove ourselves. And I think when um, test scores come out, unfortunately, it's a measurement of yep. success. I think for us, though, retention of students are gonna, is going to be our biggest measure. Because if families believe in us and see the changes in growth and excitement and learning that their children are hopefully going to go home every day. Right. That's going to be, for me, the biggest measure of success is ret you know, retention of our students and growth. Um, but I think for other schools looking at us, they're going to really look at are we, you know, how are we testing compared to the traditional public school. And right now, we don't have that measurement for our school, but micro societies across the United States are faring you know, with the traditional public school, though we're you know, approaching standards differently. And it is interesting. Some of the public schools actually take on field trips uh, children to micro society type of events where mm -hmm. every kid has a role. Of, one's a banker, one's a cop, one's mm -hmm. a, a lawyer, one's, and, and, you know, they'll have them somewhere in the state and uh, they all have to do their, their, their function. Mm -hmm. One's a reporter, mm -hmm. uh, but that's only for one day. Right. right. Or they have these CSI in there, you know, they get to be investigated, mm -hmm. you know, crime. And it, you're right. It's who done it? Who yeah. done it? But it's one day. And, and that's play. That's play mm -hmm. time. Yeah. But they're really learning. It, mm -hmm. it, and if it works mm -hmm. on that micro level, I mean, then why not have a micro society? Right. School? I know a lot of teachers every use yeah. project-based learning, and they might have a month where they have a project similar to that. Mm -hmm. And but then again, it's over after that month. And I think you know, if you talk to a lot of students, what's the most memorable thing you did in third grade, or what's something you remember from your elementary school years? It's so often that type of experience right. where it really hits home. So why not do that every day for the entire school year? Well, it's interesting because uh, that's something that I brought home from my, my youth. You know, uh, I can remember things from, from each, each year that was very significant, and that happened to be very significant to me. Uh, we learned about photosynthesis and cuttings and farming and how to make a buck. And then when you saw Abby Emmons, and I still remember her name, she got the most money. I mean, listen, I'm 52 years old, right? So it's like, how, how do I remember that? But uh, it does make an impact. It draws a picture and brings you into an experience and shows you how to do application. So what are some of the things that some of the kids might have to learn in the future that, you know, jobs, you mentioned that jobs that don't exist yet? Yeah, so we are hoping to be tech rich and have um, Eno boards. We're looking at Eno boards in classrooms, computers for, you know, computer lab and having students do a lot of STEM activities and the younger kids, there's maker space and, and these are all project-based activities that involve the critical thinking and collaboration that I was talking about earlier. You know, the other thing that's nice is we have our own school currency. 
So they have opportunities to earn money. So when we have marketplace days twice a week in our micro society period, they use the currency they earn to buy products from these ventures or agencies. So kids could be providing a service or like you said, you were farming and you could buy the plants. You know, right. they have to through their school day and earn this money. Did you and develop that, that, that curriculum, part of that? Uh, I mean, we, it's going to be an ongoing process, but, but it's the model that the micro society schools around the country mm -hmm. are following. Very interesting. Yeah. And micro Society Inc. is based in Philadelphia, and they have trainers that will be coming out and training all our staff and showing us how to unwrap the state standards and link the micro society curriculum to what we're doing in the classroom. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, is there a fee for the child to attend the micro society? It's free. It's the free. public school. Yep. Now, you're, what year is this with you folks? We're opening on September 8th. <laughs> 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 it's year one. We're in the... How big is the staff? So right now we have um, one teacher per grade level. We're capping our classes at 20. We have a couple of instructional assistants, um, business administrator, ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, There's one, one class per grade level. Yeah, too, yeah K through five. So we have six teachers to start the year. And then we hope to build the eighth grade, adding a class every year. And you're at uh, what capacity now as far as uh, filling the classrooms? So we're at about 90 registered students right now looking to, we can top out our most we can accept this year per the DOE is 120. So we are looking to fill basically third, fourth, fifth, we still have spots. So the Department of Education caps you at a certain level? Per the charter that they proposed okay. and approved, yes, we are capped at 120. And, and the location of this place is? It's at 591 West Hollis Street. It's right the, the street. old Dartmouth-Hitchcock um, medical building. Mm -hmm. So we're really excited. It's been there vacant. Um, we have an investor that is excited to be part of a charter school system, and he's you know, helping us get our building going, and we're under construction as we speak. Now, some of the parents will say, well, do you have um, access to the regular schools in case you need a gym to, to do something, uh, like do basketball or or some type of sports or theater or anything like that? Well, we're looking at partners in the area and um, we're YMCA, I've been talking to them. They're right around the corner right. and we're really excited to hopefully have a relationship with them. We will have a play playground and a multi-purpose room and the multi-purpose room will double as a gym and a cafeteria and where our micro society marketplace happens. Um, and then we'll hope to have outdoor things like basketball courts and things like that. But do do uh, local businesses sponsor you as well? I mean, do you look for sponsorships? Yes, we will be looking for sponsorships, especially mm -hmm. for our agencies and ventures. If, you know, we're going to have a bank, so we we'll love, you know, we're hoping to have banks come out and help support the ventures or whatever mm -hmm. other, you know, agencies venture, yeah. or ventures the so. children come up with, because again, it's going to come from them. Um, but yes, we also, being part of our charter school system, we don't get as much revenue as a regular traditional public school. They have right. the state, you know, the town tax base. We do not. And so we definitely need to find other revenue in other places. And we're looking for support from businesses. We'll be doing an annual fund every year and other fundraisers as well. How did you find your Danny students? This is your first year. Where, where were you? How did you get them? <laughs> Well, they had some before we came on board. That's so true. the board of trustees um, that wrote the charter is made up of some past um, administrators that were at the Lowell Magnet City School, which was the first micro society yeah. themed school in the nation. And we're lucky to have two of them on our board as mentors. It was also a couple, our chair and um, some other parent, another parent on the board were also students in that school. So, you know, we have this passionate board of trustees that wrote this charter, got their approval, and got the word out there. And they're really the ones to, that I would attribute to the starting of all this and getting the students and, and advertising. So really, honestly, at this point, it's been Facebook, so social media, <laughs> and, social and media. word of mouth. Yeah. We really, a couple really? articles in the paper, but 90 kids, and we really haven't done a lot and of marketing. And they all contacted you? And We've had a lot of questions through social media right. and, our, and our information email that's posted on our website as well. You can email us questions. So the process then that, uh, of getting a, a student there, first of all, a parent needs to decide, is this right for my child or not? Mm -hmm. How do you help them through that process? Well, we're, you know, we have an information, like I said, email, and I'm happy to contact them. We can have meetings, phone calls. You know, we can answer more specific needs, you know, 
questions about their specific child needs. You know, mm -hmm. we do have students who are identified coming, though we're not traditionally, we don't have the special education services. We work with the public schools, so that always is a concern too. Mm -hmm. um, public schools are responsible for providing those services for the children. And, and so they're funded to do so as well. And they're funded to do so. So, um, but again, it's, it's about choice. It's about having the kids understand the whys behind what they're learning in the sure. classroom. And I think that link helps a lot of other students who are sitting there day in, day out, not understanding why they need to be in school. I, I guess my, what I'm trying to get at with that, with that question is, when does a parent decide, why, what is this? Is it just a curiosity factor mm -hmm. or is it a need factor? Uh, how does a parent determine that you, you just have to sit down and counsel them either way or? Well, I mean, once we're up and going, we would invite them to see, you know, what we're doing and how we're unique and what we can offer their child. But mm -hmm. really, it's you got to look at the individual child and what their needs are. Right. And if they're not being met in the traditional public school and they're not one to be sitting in a classroom and being lectured at, perhaps this project based type of environment Mm. hands-on creativity is more for them so it's all for me I don't know if you want to jump in but for me it's you gotta look at your child and see what their needs are as a learner and see right. what school fits best and it might not be ours but I think in a lot of cases kids learn by doing I learn best by doing right you know in my job now I mean I do it I remember it and that's what we're hoping to have with kids is to really have it hit home, the learning piece hit home because they're getting their hands dirty. And this is the first year going at it. Yes. So there, you must have some butterflies with the opening day. When is opening day? September 8th. September 8th. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited. It's month. It's my yeah. favorite day of the year is first day of school. So is that, yeah, it always is. So everybody's getting their classrooms ready. How, how's the building all set up? Is it all primed and ready to go? Or? No, we are in the middle of construction, so we have our timelines, we have our plan of attack, and so we're just, you know, crossing our fingers that everything, you know, passes the muster when it all is said and done, you know, that, you know, the zoning board and the fire chief and everyone says we can have occupancy. Bingo. Right. Yeah, so. Oh, it's, and it's, well, that's right around the corner. That's, uh, that's yes. a very short period of time. Yes. Yep. How about transportation? How does that work with the, with the schools? So that's a good question. So um, first through fifth, if you live within the city of Nashua, there is free public transportation by the school district. Mm -hmm. um, however, if you come from a surrounding town or kindergartner, you'll have to carpool your child. From a surrounding town, so not necessarily Nashua. Correct. We have students from other surrounding Merrimack, Hudson. Now, do they don are they donors to the the micro society? Then, do, no, does everything. does Nashua uh, get compensated for that? Nope. No. Nope. Okay. No. Not so that at might all. be a little part of the contention with some of the, the other schools, I, I guess. Uh, yeah, we we have our own funding, state funding, mm -hmm. for the charter schools. We also have a federal startup grant that we've gotten that will be the first three years to help us get going. Um, but as far as transportation, it's on. It's part of New Hampshire state, right? You know, legislation that they have to provide transportation to any school within the city limits. So they're busing kids to Bishop Girton. They're busing kids to Infant Jesus, and they right, have right. to bus kids to us. So do they love that? No, we put a little, <laughs> you know, it is hard. It's they, I would not want their job to figure out how to I'd bus students to all these different schools. But unfortunately, there, are, there isn't a bus system for surrounding towns, so we're happy to accept them. Now, without the micro society and without the charter schools, what are the alternatives? I mean, what happens to the ch children that just tune out? Unfortunately, you know, the dropout rates tend to go up, you know, that things like that. And that's what some of the micro societies and across the, you know, states have. And when we went to conference and we met a bunch of them, they're like dropout rates have, you know, decreased in our states and, or in our town once we put a micro society school to, mm -hmm. into play. So those at risk kids came their way, got excited about school, understood the whys and why they're learning. and that there is an end in sight and this is what I can do with my diploma. Right. And they saw dropout rates turn around, so. Yeah, we've heard arguments where, well, you know, if we have this, then it's gonna take away from the public school, but the, the alternative is if some of these kids do drop out, then it does cost society that much even more because mm -hmm. their, their crime rates then, then increase, uh, you, know, it, 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 you know, they become more mm -hmm. of a, they become dependent upon the state more. And, you know, rather than contributing, they become more of a, a liability it, it, over time. And so it, helping somebody to be productive is key. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think I think we all have the same goal in mind. You know, the same end goal in mind is just you know making our students productive members of society, um, lifelong learners, sort of thing. And so I think mm -hmm. the more of us out there achieving that goal, the better. Mm -hmm. So tell me about your music program. So we're trying to hire a music teacher. We'll be posting hopefully tomorrow. Oh, good. So, yeah, we will have special classes, music, art, and PE. We'll be able to offer in year one. We hope to add in world languages as we go on. But, you know, with funding and, and what we have is limited this year, we are going to add PE, music, and, and art. So we are excited about that. I'm a strong believer in music. Me yeah. too. I believe that uh, there's, there's many aspects to, to learning with music. Uh, I know some geniuses that, that play they can have a conversation with you playing two pieces of Bach or something on their guitar. <laughs> it's you might find me roaming the halls with my guitar occasionally. Oh, there yeah. you go. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Well, I, it, it's, it's critical. I think music is a very big part of education. Uh, it's actually another language. Mm -hmm. And it's the language that mm -hmm. builds bridges mm -hmm. when there's barriers. Yep. So, we're, yeah, we're hoping to have our, a music room and an art room, and we're going to, you know, so Get those if, staff members on board soon, I hope. <laughs> how, who do you have reaching out to the local businesses to uh, see if, uh, as far as sponsorships and stuff? That's part of my role. Yeah. It, will, it will be. Well, I mean, right now we're, we're putting the puzzle pieces together just to be ready for day one, getting our, our curriculum in our hands and aligning it with the teaching standards. But, um, but throughout the year, that will be one of my roles is That's to reach out to, part, so you, to business partners and you know knock on the doors yes. and say hey yes. you know we have Absolutely. an opportunity for, you know mm -hmm. that that's interesting and that's good um hopefully some of the businesses nashville is a wonderful town mm -hmm. it, it, it a lot of people reach out and a lot of people have a lot of different organizations helping out a lot of different mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. yeah and i've had some outreach already from some organizations to join weekly meetings so i, t I tend to do that once again there's priorities and once to build it you know, the building's open, and then we'll go that way. Hopefully I can join those and, and network with other business mm -hmm. um, businesses in the area. Um, at the same time, we have what we call the Friends of Max, which is also our PTA, where we have, um, we want parent and teacher volunteers to help fundraise and, and go out and solicit help as well. So we have this committee that hopefully will help build revenue for the school as well. Right. And do you have target amounts that you, you have in mind already, or...? No, we don't. No, we don't. But it will help. You know, we hope to have more money in order to bring in more technology and programs into the school. That would be the main focus. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we can say we need an Eno board for another classroom, you know, and we can raise the funds for something like that. So we're, you know, our plans too is to have an annual fund every year, similar to a lot of private schools and public schools. Right. And hope, you know, in hopes to generate some money as well. You know, the more. The fund, funding we have, the more we can do to support kids in their learning, right. whether that be through staff members, through programs. So that's our hope. So September 9th? 8th. 8th. September 8th. Well, I wish you the best. Uh, any final thoughts for our guests to know? Uh, how, how did I get in touch with you? I'm sure we got it on the screen right here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um, maxnewhampshire.org. Max. Yeah, M-A-C-S-NewHampshire.org. Okay. N-H.org, I should say. And there's a email on there that you can email and contact us with any questions. And actually, this Thursday, we're having a parent info night, and we hope to have one in August as well. And where would that be at? The mid-August one, we're going to, our neighbors, um, the St. Philip's Greek Orthodox Church is yep. lending us some space there. Very so nice. we're making friends with our neighbors down the street, and they'll be lending space to us to have a parent night, hopefully on August 12th at 7 p.m. Okay. Well, Amy and Susanna. Yes. I got it right. Thank you for joining us in uh, the Micro Society Academy Charter School located here in Nashville, New Hampshire. Yay. Yay. Let's go for it. Thank you. Well Thanks for having us. Thank you. And uh, if you're interested in, in, uh, in finding a, a position for your child, please contact them. And if you have a, a, a topic that you'd like to talk about, come on, Gate City Chronicles. We'd love to have you. Uh, in the meantime, Thanks for watching Gate City Chronicles. Until next week. Thank you for watching Gate City Chronicles. And we want to thank our sponsor, Aardvark Cleaning. They've been a sponsor for quite a few years now, and uh, we appreciate them being a sponsor. And if you want to be a guest on our show, contact accessnashua at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your story. Until next week, thanks for watching.
preceding program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.